I love this system. This is the Game Boy. And it came out in 1989, which is one year before I was born. And I spent many, many years playing on a system very much like this one, but not this one exactly. I got this one when I was a little older. And the Game Boy was a very formative console for me uh, as a kid. I spent many hours in the back of the car playing Pokemon, hearing uh, possible secrets and rumors about things that could happen, discovering the missing no glitch, which kind of blew my child mind. And I think in many ways, um, this console kind of pushed me in a certain direction in my life and, and has has kind of been one of the big reasons that I've ended up where I am now and doing the kinds of things that I'm doing. So I've got a lot to thank uh, this little console for. And a few years ago, I decided I really wanted to understand it at a deeper level. And so I set about writing an emulator. And that emulator was co is called Spellboy. It's open source. It's on my GitHub page. It's not the world's most sort of accurate or complete emulator. I mean, I strived to make it actually quite accurate. Um, so for example, the, the pixel processing and everything like that is as accurate as I could make it. Um, but it doesn't cover all cases and there's a lot, there's some hardware that isn't covered. One notable example is audio, uh, but it will certainly play a, a fair few games without any hitches. And I learned a lot from doing that. I learned a whole bunch about how the architecture of the system works, about how some of kind of the hardware decisions of the Game Boy informed kind of some of the constraints that programmers would later face when making games. But one thing that kind of you don't really learn about while you're writing an emulator is how people actually programmed for this console. And that is because what you end up doing is you, you emulate the CPU, you implement every instruction that the processor can run and you have to implement exactly what that does and how the CPU responds to it in terms of setting flags. And so you learn about how the assembly language works, but you never see the patterns in which people use when they write the games. That's kind of something completely different. And so I felt kind of bad about that. And in the last couple of weeks, I decided I'm actually going to write my own Game Boy game. And that's what I've done. I've written a game called Block Jump, which is based on uh, Google Chrome's uh, offline dinosaur jumping game. Uh, so a very simple game, very simple mechanics, but nonetheless, it has turned out to be one of the more complex programming projects that I've ever taken on. And it really sort of tested my ability to debug and figure out kind of creative solutions. So I've really enjoyed uh, this project and I'm really proud to show it even though it is not the most impressive looking game, nor the world's most challenging. So keep that in mind when, you <laughs> when your bad reviews for my game come in. Anyway, this is gonna be a fairly long video and I'm gonna break it down into lots of different sections. Uh, and so I'm gonna annotate them in the YouTube video and you can jump around. And one of the hooks of this video in particular is that I didn't go about writing this game in the normal path. I actually wrote this game in TypeScript now, you're probably going to question how that is even possible. How can you write a Game Boy game in TypeScript? And I will answer that question. And I hope that you won't be, uh, well, you won't consider this video clickbait in any way. Um, because that part is also extremely interesting from a development point of view as well. Um, but some of the things we're going to cover are how the how the game works itself, how the architecture of the Game Boy is kind of put together and how people actually program for the Game Boy. So I wanna kind of dive in before getting into the game itself and just show some of the programming patterns that, that you have to use while, uh, while using the Game Boy, uh, programming for the Game Boy rather. And I'm kind of gonna take a sweeping tour through the system as well. And I'm gonna show some of the subsystems of the game like the graphics and the physics and the collision and the random number generator and the compression algorithm, which is one of the things I'm most proud of in, in this game. So it's uh, it's been a real sort of old school getting back to my getting back to my roots. I mean, not my roots. I learned, you know, high level languages from the beginning, but it's been about getting back to that spirit of kind of resource constrained computing and figuring out the better ways of doing things or making the trade offs. And those trade-offs actually being real rather than kind of 
you know, the kind of discussions you see online these days about people having too much computing power and no one does things the right way anymore. And it's kind of all of that for me is very up in the air and kind of a useless discussion. But it's actually fun to get back to some of the older systems and, and just see how people used to do it, you know. So I really hope you enjoy this video and uh, let's just dive into it. All right, so before we really get into it, let's take a look at the game running. I'm running this on real hardware here, and the reason I can do that is because I have a flash cartridge, which has an SD card and allows you to load ROMs on to the Game Boy itself. Now, this game is called Block Jump. Uh, you are a block, and you can jump, and that's kind of the whole long and short of it, actually. <laughs> the obstacles, they, they scroll in from the right, and you have to jump over them, and if you aren't able to jump over them correctly, then you will get game over. Now, there is no real score or difficulty progression, so to speak. Um, the game doesn't get faster or there are no more sort of extra obstacles generated as you go along. What you, what you see here is what you get. And that was kind of an intentional decision that I, I sort of kept in so that I could eventually make this video <laughs> rather than working on this game forever. But there's definitely potential to improve upon there. And actually, as we go along in this video, most of what we'll see will be work done in an emulator rather than on the hardware itself. Although it's great to see that the game does correctly run on the hardware, it's much more convenient to actually do the running on an emulator and have benefits like a debugger. So with that kind of uh, contextualized, let's actually go and take a look at some of the programming and some of the game systems of the Game Boy. Okay, so I mentioned that this game was written in TypeScript rather than General Assembly, and I'm going to kind of explain how that works now. It's not magic, and of course the Game Boy is not running any form of TypeScript on board. That would be uh, absolutely insane, although I'm sure that someone can make that work. I'm sure that someone will could write a JavaScript interpreter that run on the Game Boy, but that seems like an insane idea to me. So instead, the way that this works is through a library that I wrote something around a year ago uh, called Tega, which loosely stands for the TypeScript Embedded Macro Assembler. And what it is, is the it's the idea of a macro assembler on steroids. So it's a type safe DSL embedded into the programming language itself that allows you to express assembly and blocks of assembly and labels and everything you can imagine like that in terms of type safe function calls and variables and that kind of thing. And then in the end, you can create a program description and you feed it to the assembler and it will produce a Game Boy ROM. So I hope you don't feel like you've been clickbaited. Uh, it wasn't my intention. Uh, I do think it's really interesting and there are some big benefits. So one of the big benefits is that there's no need for a linker or anything like that. If you've done any assembly work, or you even if you've written languages like C and C++, um, you'll know that you need something called a linker. You generally compile each of your uh, sort of your assembly files or your C files, or your C++, your translation units. You compile them individually and you create an object file out of that. And in the end, when you've kind of created all of your different object files, you can link them together into the final application. That's not necessary here. And of course, that there was a reason for doing that, and there still is in some ways. But that's completely irrelevant, that, that system, uh, because we can actually take advantage of the fact that this is embedded in a programming language, and therefore we can take advantage of the module system that lives inside this programming language. So if I happen to um, have, say, in my block jump game, I have uh, a module called DMA, and inside DMA I can create some uh, assembly functions, and I can create some regular functions, and I can export a bunch of things from here, and then I can bring that into the place where I actually use the program, and I can just use those exported members. And everything just works because it's already a module system. I don't have to worry about uh, compiling each individual unit separately. Uh, and there's also no real, real kind of performance 
uh, benefits or drawbacks to, to speak of here because we're talking about running on modern computers and not computers from back in the day where the challenge of creating a Game Boy game is, is really, um, well, let's just say our modern computers can stand up to that challenge. Okay, so what I want to do here is I just want to kind of introduce the idea of Tega a little bit, show you how you write a Tega program before we actually dive into the the nuts and bolts of the game itself because I think it helps to have some context about this system and kind of the Game Boy in general before we go full force. So we're going to see a couple of the, the modern twists and the ways that we can write quote unquote macros in Tega and macros are really just functions uh, since everything in Tega is uh, just a, an object or a function or, or whatever. Okay, so I've set up this basic file here. You'll see that there's some imports here uh, for the file system. There is the assembler uh, assemble function that we call down here with the program. And you'll see some writing out some information to the console and finally writing the, the game that we get from the assembler to the disk. And the program here has nothing inside and I've got a bunch of unused imports here. So the first thing I wanna show is kind of one of the most important instructions in the entire Game Boy CPU. And I haven't mentioned this so far, but the Game Boy's CPU is something called an SM83. It's manufactured by Sharp and it's a kind of, um, it's kind of like a Z80, it's kind of like an 8080 uh, and it's kind of both and neither at the same time. So it's something kind of special, but if you've done any Z80 programming, um, then you probably will recognize uh, some elements of it. Uh, and you'll notice that some elements are also missing from it. But one of the most important instructions in the entire CPU is the load instruction. And that's represented with LD. And this is basically how we shuttle data around in the program. So we can get a data that we've data that we've defined here in the program, like an, an 8-bit value, like 22. We can load it into a register. And we can load registers into each other, uh, like move their values around, copy them around, and we can write values into memory. Uh, but there are some very specific limitations with how that can work. So um, there, this is known as the addressing modes of the Game Boy, and the Game Boy has a particular set of addressing modes, uh, which are limited, but also have some powerful capabilities. So let's just take a look at the simplest of cases so far, just putting direct data into a register. So there is a reg8 enum that contains uh, the 8-bit registers of the Game Boy. Um, these are the kind of architect architecturally usable registers. There is uh, another 8-bit register called the F register, and that contains the flags. You can't actually use that register like a general purpose register. So it's not something you can put into instructions, and therefore it's not something that you can see here. Um, so let's just put some data into the A register. I'm going to use a, I'm going to use an unsigned 8-bit value, and it's going to be 22. Let's say. So this works. This is fine. This will load that. This will create a, an assembly instruction that encodes that 22 directly in the program, and this instruction will load that into the A register when it's run. Um, now, because of the way that the Game Boy works. The A register is kind of special. Um, it's the accumulator register, and it's where the results of all arithmetic type operations happen, but it's also sort of the central point for going between memory and for loading immediate values. So something which is not possible in the Game Boy is, um, let me see, uh, is something like this. If I want to load from an address into the B register, and let's say my address is 3333, this is just not legal by construction because no overload matches this call according to the Game Boy. So I'm trying to take this address and take what's there and load it into B. It's simply not allowed. This would have to be the A register and then it becomes legal. So this is kind of one of the powerful things about the embedded uh, assembly language uh, within the program is that we can actually ensure that every version of load is is the only one that you can specify. You can't specify an incorrect instruction. 
Um, and if we actually take a look at the signature of load here, we'll see that there are 41 different signatures. So there are this, this instruction does a lot. And you can see that as you go through, this is every possible uh, conceivable version. Now I didn't write those by hand. I actually generated all of these um, uh, type uh, definitions uh, based on a JSON file that describes all of the various operations of the Game Boy. Um, so there is this DMG Ops uh, JSON. I took it from uh, a project online, which is called the GB Ops. If you search GB Ops uh, in Google, you get this amazing uh, table of instructions that's searchable, that tells you every clock cycle time, that tells you the flags that are set. I basically passed this file and generate a uh, file in Tega called Ops, which you see just has all of these various um, uh, signatures and then it generates one sort of actual implementation concrete implementation so these are only type information for the TypeScript uh, uh, engine and for any sort of uh, linting checkers that you might use as well so this will also work in JavaScript uh, but this is kind of the generated uh, code for that assembly instruction and how it will create it so this is an emulator. I'm not running the instruction here. What this is doing is encoding the value that you give it as uh, as a particular opcode. So this is quite verbose, but luckily you don't have to write this by hand and you don't read this file. This is a generated file. And in the end, it's something like 1300 uh, lines long. And the generator script for that is actually in a different place. It's in this scripts. And uh, yeah, you can take a look at that if you're interested in how that works. Um, okay, so we can also take 8-bit registers, uh, pairs of them, and jam them together and use them as a 16-bit register. So there are some restrictions around this as well, as you might imagine, but it does work. So we can use the reg16 enum, and we can reference these four register pairs. <coughs> the last one is actually not a register pair, it's the stack pointer, and that's a special register on its own. And it's kind of architecturally hidden for the most part. We're only exposed to it um, through this interface of uh, where this can be used. So the stack pointer is also in here, but really we have these three pairs. So we have BC, which is the combination of the B and the C registers, DE and HL. So we can load into BC a U16, which is uh, something like OX1234, and this is fine. Um, it wouldn't be legal for us to load into register 8 the EU16 value because you can't put a U16 into reg 8. So that's pretty clear. And the HL, uh, the HL register 16 is a special one. This is one of the Game Boy's kind of like secret weapons is that this combination, this pair of registers, HL, um, can be used uh, to also load to and from memory. So what we can do, for instance, is we can load uh, some uh, into register eight, uh, into register A. And by the way, I didn't mention this, but the destination comes first. So we always specify where the data is going and then the data itself. So it's it's destination source. It's one of those uh, <coughs> those types. So we're going to load into A what we find through the reg pointer. So this is a reg16 pair used as a pointer. And here we can specify various different ones. And you'll notice the stack pointer is not here anymore. So we can't reference directly through the stack pointer, but we can use B, C, D, E, and HL. And you'll also notice that we can use HL dec and HL inc. And what that means is that we are gonna load the value that's at HL into A. So we've stuffed the address into this register and we're gonna read what's at that address but when we read what's at that address, if we use HL inc, for instance, is we'll read what's at one, two, three, four, but then we'll increment the address inside HL to be one, two, three, five. And that's really useful. If you need to read a bunch of data from memory and sort of do something with it, if you need to, you know, if you have a structure of data somewhere, you can actually read these values in sequence and it's a really useful thing. And of course you can do this the other way around. So you can write data to the HL pointer. So if I write reg16 pointer HL, and I use the value that's in reg8a, I can actually write 
to this address. So in this case, after having done these two instructions, it will be one, two, three, five. I can actually write to that address. And I can also write to that address and then increment the pointer. So this is a really powerful tool. And the HL register is the only one that you can do this with. So you can also um, write to the value of the BC register, but you can't increment afterwards. So if you want to do something, like if you have to increment, uh, implement a, a function like memcopy, then you're going to make use of the HL pointer. It's pretty cool. And HL, I believe, and I'm going to check this li live right now. So we can't load a U8 directly into BC, but I think we can write directly into HL. And this is kind of nice as well. HL is actually treated for the most part in the in the system as a register itself. It's an indirect register. So um, you can think of HL being a, a memory register that's anywhere in the, the, the program or anywhere in, in memory. <coughs> so pretty cool, uh, pretty interesting stuff. All right, um, so what else can we do? Well, of course we have arithmetic type instructions. We have things like add, so we can add uh, reg8a with uh, reg8b. And this is pretty cool. And of course this is, this works the same way, so the, the destination is, is specified here on the left. And the kind of interesting, again, limitation in the Game Boy's uh, CPU is that the A register is special, it's the accumulator, it's the only place that you can store the results of arithmetic operations. So if I tried to say that we do this the other way around, then this is not a legal instruction. You cannot add uh, B and A and store the result in B. It's simply not something you can do. So this is uh, a pretty nice one. And of course here, this is an example where we can also use the, um, the HL pointer. So we can add, <coughs> we can add uh, to uh, reg A here and we could also increment afterwards and that would be fine. Well, actually that's not fine in this case. You can go through the register pointer, but you can't uh, increment afterwards. This is the beauty of a type safe programming language, uh, uh, type safe assembly language. It can actually tell you in real time what you can and can't do. And apparently I forgot that you can't do that. So that's always good to learn. Of course we can subtract as well. So that works in the same way. And we have things like um, uh, a logical shift uh, or a, how does this work? Uh, left shift. I don't remember what this instruction is. Um, of course we have shifts. We also have right shift, right logical. This is a right logical shift. Hmm. I don't remember exactly what all of these different instructions do. I'm just trying to remember what the actual mnemonic is of the, the shift. So maybe I will crack open this um, ops file again and we'll find the L S. Mm. Mm. Well, okay, well, we won't do that right now, <laughs> but there are left shifts and right shifts. Um, there is, of course, also uh, um, and, so we can do something like a, a binary operation with the and. We can, for example, uh, use this to isolate the, uh, the topmost bit in A, so we could get the most significant bit by anding with, uh, uh, with hex 80. And of course, the result of and also goes into the accumulator. Now there is an exception here. So the exception is the increment and the decrement uh, instructions. With increment and decrement, we can also increment A. We can also increment B. And then this doesn't put the result into A. The result stays in B. So this is actually one of those also quite nice things that you don't have to um, worry too much about. And this does make life easy because 
often when you're writing a loop or something like that, you have to sort of increment, you have to keep one register that's keeping the number of times you're looping and you want to increment that and then check if that has uh, reached a certain point. And it would be very annoying if you had to shuttle all values back and forward between A and other registers. So this is kind of nice. Um, that's kind of it for the arithmetic and the binary operations. This is, you know, standard stuff. So it's not anything special that you wouldn't find in any other kind of assembly language. Let's talk about um, uh, jumps. And jumps are basically the way which we move around the program and also the way in which we uh, can branch. So what I mean by branching is that we can do a comparison and choose to go one way or the other. So an if statement, if you will. So what we can actually do is to, for example, let's um, create a label. And a label is just a symbolic address uh, that sort of represents a place in the program without having to specifically know its location. So if I create a label here and I'll call it uh, begin, you can call it anything you want. I'll call this label begin. And then down here, I could uh, jump to the label begin. And notice that labels are just function calls. And if the function call occurs in the instruction stream, then that refers to a kind of set this, this name to be this symbolic value. And if it occurs inside an instruction, well, it means that we're referring to the symbolic value itself. <coughs> and this is something where we could also uh, make use of abstraction and kind of put this into a variable. Uh, and we'll call it begin. And we could instead just use begin here and use begin here. And this would work in exactly the same way. So this is quite a nice uh, uh, sort of already a very simple piece of abstraction that you can do that can make life easier if you want to be able to change the names of your labels without having to worry about the fact that you're duplicating strings around. But it's also quite straightforward to do it this way. Um, so this is a way that we could jump here and we could also jump back to begin depending on sort of, uh, let's say the result of this decrement instruction. So if this decrement instruction happened to be zero, like we, we brought B down to such level that it became zero, well, we could choose to jump on that condition. And the way in which we do that is we're able to jump on a flag. So every instruction more or less will set the flags depending on what occurred. Now, that's not true for every instruction. Some, are, some instructions will not set flags. Some instructions will set flags, but they won't have a real meaning. And some instructions will set flags that have a referenceable meaning. <coughs> Excuse me, but even there, there are some, uh, some, some limitations and uh, gotchas that you can run into. So there are basically four, four or two possible conditions that we can branch on depending on how you think about it. We can either branch on the fact that an operation uh, resulted in a carry. So if we add two numbers and they, one of those numbers exceeds uh, 255 and we roll back around to zero or more, then that would result in a carry. And likewise, if we happen to do a subtraction that took us below zero, that would also set the carry flag. So we can actually branch on the carry flag. We can branch if the carry flag wasn't set. And between those two, uh, you actually then have the ability to check if one number is bigger than the other. Because if you uh, if you subtract two numbers and the carry flag gets set, well, you know that the number you subtracted was actually larger. So that's an interesting thing that you can do there. Um, we can also um, we can also uh, branch depending on the result of the zero flag. So the zero flag, um, as you might imagine, is set when the result of an operation was zero. And we can also branch if it's not zero. So this is a very good way to set up counters. Um, you might, you know, set a, a one of your um, you might set one of your registers to say ten and decrement that register and then immediately check if if the result flag uh, zero was set. And if the zero flag is set, it means that you've kind of reached, you've counted down from 10 to zero and you're done. So we could uh, use the zero flag here and we would only, uh, we would only end up 
branching back up if it was zero. <clears throat> now you might imagine that this is kind of an annoying thing in the program that every label you create is kind of global in a way uh, because we don't have the linker like you have in a traditional um, assembler um, because we don't have a linker uh, everything is global and that's kind of known to be not the best programming paradigm so there is something that we can do is, is to use a scope so a scope uh, basically allows us to give a name to a particular region so let's call this the 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 whatever really great name then we can just provide some assembly instructions and then what I can do here is use a label again so I can use the label begin in here and I can reference the label begin inside this scope and it's not going to affect any other label that was called begin it's much like it's much more like a namespace in that way we've basically namespaced this begin label within this whatever scope and often when you do this you sort of don't care about naming the the outer scope you just want to have a self-confined uh, self-contained place that um, that allows you to create a label like loop or wait or something like that which you want to use all over the place you don't want to come up with a creative name for loop every single time you need to do a loop so for that we can use something called an unnamed scope and as you might imagine that literally just doesn't provide a name here now the interesting thing about these functions is that they're not anything um, special inside the assembler this is the result of what we can do with abstraction um, so this is part of what's called the standard library in um, in Tega and Tega just basically exports all the types that the assembler uses um, so the type for this kind of uh, operation is um, an op description so this is a, an operation that can be done within the assembler the the result of the label is a symbolic label and indeed if we hover over the assembly operation we can see that these are the various kinds of types that make up an assembler operation so we can have symbolic labels op descriptions inline bytes uh, which is just directly having you know data inside the program uh, offset control which is to do with moving kind of uh, where you're putting the data inside the program at any given moment and compound operations which are just uh, one assembler operation which represents a bunch of assembler operations so the fact that uh, unnamed scope is is this thing it's not anything special um, if I hadn't included this in the library someone could have written it anyway and that's kind of the beauty of uh, embedding a DSL inside a real programming language is that you get real powerful abstractions so it's not just about being able to um, write a function that then produces a set of five assembly instructions and you give it one name that's pretty nice as well um, but we can also do things like this which is scoping and just it's not important for now but the way in which the the scopes actually work is that they um, they create a set of labels <clears throat> or any label that gets created inside the scope this unnamed scope function or the the scope function which this is based on will actually analyze the set of operations you've uh, you've provided and it will go into all those labels and it will append or prepend the namespace and because it prepends the namespace there it makes sure that that is indeed a um, a globally unique name so we still have global symbols uh, but we get kind of uh, the advantage of treating them like they're local symbols and that's what's really important actually uh, if you think about it all symbols in um, in compiled languages are also sort of global symbols they also have to be unique in some way and the linker or the assembler or whatever has to be able to sort those symbols out in the end so this is just a sort of more exposed version of that okay uh, the final thing I actually want to show here <clears throat> is that there are more things in this standard library so I would uh, if we had more time I would show how to implement some of these things from scratch but we can also use things like if uh, if equal and if equal allows us to supply a register and a literal so for instance we could supply register 8a and we could supply a literal 
like the number seven. And then we could basically provide um, a body, which is just an object with a then and a potential else. So if it happens that a is equal to seven, then we're going to do this set of instructions. Uh, so that's pretty cool, right? We could then uh, increment a uh, here. And that would be something we could do. And then, of course, we could also supply an else and do exactly the same thing. So maybe we decrement register a here. <coughs> and this is, again, just something that you can write with abstraction. This is um, basically going to look at the flags and it's going to create a sequence of instructions that um, will take a look at certain instructions taking place, the result of the flags that come out of those, and it will jump to one place or the other. And it will sort of automatically create a sort of symbolic location for the them path and the else path and for the return path. And what we see is that this creates a, a compound operation, which basically says it's an assembler operation that contains more assembler operations. So we have if equal, we also have um, if not equal, if unsigned greater than, so we can check if a register, um, if a literal is unsigned greater than a particular register, or if this register is unsigned greater than this particular literal. Uh, it works on the, the left to right basis. So in this case, we would be saying um, is register B uh, greater than the literal uh, 42 and if it is we can do more uh, more with that <coughs> and uh, yeah we have more like that so the standard library it contains some macro abstractions like the ifs and the scopes but it also contains some actual functions so um, there is a function uh, like memcopy that you can use from the standard library and it also exposes uh, a helper like a helper to call this function because the way in which we call functions in the assembly language is to use the call instruction. And here we might uh, call memcopy uh, dot start, which basically says this is the starting position of memcopy. <coughs> Excuse me, my throat is very dry now. This is the starting position of memcopy. We also have labels for the end of memcopy <clears throat> and for the return instruction of memcopy and the size of memcopy. So uh, this is another primitive that we have in the macro assembler. It's called a block. We can create a named block and it will provide uh, things like the start, the end, and the size to us so that we can do things with that. But this is the way we would call memcopy, but memcopy requires us to set some registers up first. Um, uh, so we have to set a source register that has a pointer to some place in memory that we want to copy from. We have to set a, a register that says where we want to copy to. Um, so these are the 16-bit register pairs. <clears throat> and we have to set a 16-bit register pair that says the size of the data we're copying from the destination to the source, uh, from the source to the destination. So the easier way of calling memcopy is to use the call underscore memcopy. And here we can just provide these three things. So we can provide the source. So let's say the source is the address one, two, three, four. The destination, well, that can be the address two, three, four, five. And the size, that's going to be a U16, um, which is the value uh, 55 in hex. Now, I've realized that these aren't, these shouldn't actually be addresses. These should be U16s as well. And the reason that they're not explicitly addresses is because um, they're not, we're not talking about a pointer type here. Uh, we're, we're talking about a value that's interpreted as a pointer as one of the arguments. So that's a kind of caveat, but the type system steps in and saves us there and shows us that that wasn't valid. And what this will do is copy hex 55 bytes from this location to this location linearly. And that's just a standard library function. So that's not something you have to worry about implementing yourself. All right, so that was kind of a whirlwind tour through the very basics of Tega, <clears throat> the basics of some of the assembly programming on the Game Boy. And what I can show you is just how this gets built. So down here below the program, we can see these three functions. So we call the assemble function with the program. 
and we can provide this set of objects, uh, sorry, this object which provides a set of uh, information that will be used to build the, the so-called cartridge header. And the cartridge header is what the Game Boy reads to understand certain things about your game. So what kind of features it supports and what the name of the game is and who the publisher was and what the checksums are. And uh, the Game Boy will actually check some of the checksums and if they don't match, it won't play them. Um, that's different to something like an emulator, which would typically allow you to skip the checks, checksum uh, checks. And uh, we won't get into how those are calculated because it's not really important for now, but it is something to keep in mind. So we can assemble the program. What we get from that is a result that has a buffer of bytes, which just represents the program itself. It also gives us back a symbol table. So that is going to be all of the symbols we define in the program um, with the addresses that uh, match to those symbols. So that's actually really useful. You can use that to, uh, well, of course, kind of figure out where things ended up in your program. But you can also use it to create a symbol file. And the symbol file can be also loaded up into an emulator if that emulator has a debugger. And there is a standard format for uh, symbols in a game and showing their memory locations and everything like that. So that if you actually go and look at a breakpoint, you'll see that, oh wait, this is the name of this function here, or this is this place in RAM, which represents this variable that I have. So symbols are pretty cool. It's pretty useful for debugging purposes. We actually create a formatted symbol, um, symbol file but it only represents the uh, the ROM space. So if you actually wanted to also include information about symbols that you've defined in RAM, then you have to supply that stuff yourself. Um, and there is a final offset, which basically says, this is the place that the last byte was um, inserted into your game. And thus, um, this is the size. It's not the last byte, it's the place that the next byte would be placed. So it actually tells you kind of the size of, uh, <laughs> the size of the space that you used effectively. And of course you can move that pointer around. So it doesn't always indicate that. Like if you happen to, the very last thing here was a call to um, set offset, and then we set the offset to zero, well, we would see zero here, and which wouldn't be a very useful metric, but you're probably not gonna do that. So uh, in this case, I can actually print out the size of the ROM and we can write out to the disk. So I'm actually just gonna run this program, which is TS node source uh, demo. And when I run that, if there are no errors, well, there were errors. So it couldn't resolve the symbol mem copy. Oh, that's actually really interesting because yeah, even though uh, we put a call to mem copy in, we didn't actually include the function mem copy inside the ROM. Like what we see here inside this array is everything we're gonna put in the ROM. So we actually need to place <laughs> the mem copy function in. And what I would normally do for that is make a kind of comment here that kind of segments off, this is the code section and here is kind of the data section as it were, or this is the place where I'm gonna insert other data. And what we would do here is just, um, there is an export in the standard library called standard functions. And we would just pop that here and that's gonna include all of the, the standard libraries. Uh, and if I just follow that through, uh, and we go and look at that, that includes a function for wait for vblank, mem copy, apply an offset to an HL pointer, apply an offset to a DE pointer, and a mem set operation. So these are just all the things that I basically created while I was making block jump that I thought this would probably be pretty useful to other people as well. So now we have the standard functions, we can run the run the code again. And you can see that this time around, it actually did uh, produce a ROM. And you'll see that we also include all of those functions that we created. Uh, so if you wanted, you could also include only the functions you use from the standard library. <coughs> That's possible. You would just have to do a little bit more work than inserting this one word here. You would have to individually pull that say uh, mem copy, and you would have to insert the block of data that represents it. And if we did that, that would also work. Um, and this co this time around, we get a smaller ROM. So instead of having 425 bytes, we have a 385 byte ROM that includes mem copy and our begin symbol.
And that's kind of, uh, that's going to be it for this little part. I'm going to introduce the memory map of the Game Boy next. Um, but I hope this has given some sense of how Tega works and given some reference frame for when we actually go and dive into some of the systems of the block jump game itself, that you're not left in the dark, uh, not understanding anything about how any of this works and faced with kind of like, how is it possible there is an if equal when this is an assembly language? Yeah, so let's actually go over, take a look at the memory map of the Game Boy and see what facilities the hardware offers and, and how we can actually interact with the various systems on board. Okay, so this is the memory map of the Game Boy. Um, if you've seen some of my other videos and my other series, then the idea of a memory map and the idea of kind of writing to memory and having that do something aside from just putting a value into memory, instead doing some sort of functionality with the hardware, you'll be familiar with that kind of stuff. I've been over it in my uh, virtual machine series uh, and that went all the way into building the kind of fantasy console element. And you also would have seen it in the Risk v um, uh, series as well, where we sort of created the memory map of that from scratch as well. So in the Game Boy, it's no different. The address space is 16 bits. So it means that we have everything from zero, uh, hex zero up until hex FFFF is representable in the program, uh, is an address that we can use. And uh, that address space is divided up into different functionalities. So some of it represents the, the ROM inside the cartridge. Some of it represents RAM. Some of it represents special registers that do things with the hardware of the Game Boy. So let's actually take a little look here. So the first 16 kilobytes of uh, the address space from zero to 4,000 hex represents ROM bank zero. Now, this is basically uh, the way in which you can add more data to a Game Boy cartridge because many games had more than just a few kilobytes of, of game information, especially if they were quite graphically intensive or they happened to store a lot of level data or something like that. And you would use a lot more space than that. And the way that that works is that you can, you can map in different banks of memory as the game is progressing. Um, now this is a hardware limited thing, so you actually had to have the hardware inside a cartridge in order to switch banks. And very basic games like Tetris didn't have any ROM banks, uh, didn't have any banked uh, ROM. Uh, but later games like Pokemon absolutely did have uh, what's called a memory bank controller, which could uh, you can interact with by also reading and writing certain kinds of memory addresses, which will allow you to switch the banks around. So the first uh, 16 kilobytes is ROM bank zero. It's always ROM bank zero. You can't change that one. The next one can represent uh, every bank from one onwards. So uh, if you have 20 banks in your game, which is possible, then uh, you can switch uh, which sort of uh, 16 kilobyte region of your ROM is visible in that window. Okay, and then after that uh, comes VRAM. And VRAM actually contains uh, what's well, the video RAM of the console. So it's the kind of graphics area of the console. And it it's a special area of RAM. It's not like it's physically different from the other RAM locations. Um, you can only access it at certain times of uh, execution. So the Game Boy, as it's drawing to the screen, you can't actually access it while it's drawing information to the screen. Um, uh, this is a, a limitation. You can only access VRAM when uh, kind of the the scan line, as it were, so the way that the game draws uh, the screen out is not every pixel at once, but rather it draws it line by line and draws it left to right, line by line. So as it goes off the right side of the screen, there is a, a, a period of time called H blank, which is a short period of time before it gets to the next line. And during H blank, you can go and access VRAM. And when it gets to the end of the whole frame, you have a much longer region of time called V blank. And during V blank, then you can also access the VRAM. And most of the sort of important graphical stuff that you do in the game will happen during v, uh, v blank. So VRAM is an eight kilobyte region um, that goes from hex 8000 to hex A. And it basically um, contains the tile data 
so the games uh, games on the Game Boy are made up of tile data uh, which are just little 8x8 eight eight pixel um, uh, grids that you can put together in a sort of jigsaw puzzle style way and create a, create a bigger screen so you have the tile data themselves that describes like uh, how those little 8x8 eight eight, uh, graphics come together and then you have uh, tile map regions which define kind of screens of data and they don't have to contain all of the data that's in the tiles themselves they can just point to a tile in tile data and the nice thing about this is that you can change both the tiles and the tile maps during execution time so if you've got a lot of different environments and interesting things you can swap that in from your ROM banks as the game is progressing okay so next we have external RAM so this is um, something that is not always present, but if you happen to have a memory bank controller in your uh, Game Boy game, that can actually map this region into um, a, an onboard RAM chip. So if you imagine taking a Game Boy cartridge and kind of opening it up, what you'll see inside is several different chips. And the basic chip you'll see in there is a ROM chip, which just contains read-only data that was produced, was sort of stamped in at the factory and sent out. But some other games, much more complex games, also included their own RAM because RAM is also a very limited resource on the Game Boy and having external RAM is very useful. So that's something you can do if, the, if your cartridge hardware allows for it. Then there is a four kilobyte region of uh, working RAM and it's actually an eight kilobyte region of working RAM but the second uh, four kilobytes is bankable but only in the Game Boy Color. So this is not something that's available, for instance, on the Game Boy Pocket. Um, so what you have is eight kilobytes by default of RAM. And if you happen to have uh, the Game Boy Color, then you have more RAM and you can bank it in and out in the same way that you can bank in and out the ROM banks. Okay, so then after that, we get a seven and a half kilobyte region of uh, something that just mirrors some of the earlier code so it mirrors everything from um from here from this region of work ram up until some midpoint of this work ram this bankable part um, but nintendo actually officially say that you shouldn't use it uh, so it, it's illegal to read and write from there but in most cases it doesn't actually crash the game boy so you can actually just get a kind of a copy of what would be there in a relative sense Okay, then after that, we have 160 bytes of OAM memory. And this is why I wrote uh, not to scale, um, because this diagram, although it was in scale up until uh, this point, it sort of drops out of being in scale after this. We, we're going from kilobytes to bytes. So OAM is something called object attribute memory. And object attribute memory is how we describe the sprites of the game. So sprites are basically like uh, tiles in a way, they, they have a tile, but they also have an arbitrary X and Y position, and they have some flags associated with them so that you can kind of flip the the, the visual graphics and the horizontal plane or the, the vertical plane, and you can do things, uh, some interesting things using that. And basically you have 40 individual um, OEM entries, sprite entries. And there are some limitations about how many uh, OEM entries can be shown on a single line and this is where you see people's emulators uh, stand up or fall down is if they can correctly show the right number of sprites on a line and all the edge conditions around that um, but yeah OEM is basically if we've got a character in the game like the block uh, or if we've got like the obstacles that come along they're going to be things that are represented in OEM so we're going to see that when we go into the code there then we have 96 bytes of unusable memory, unusable address space. And then we have 128 bytes of I.O. registers. Now, I.O. registers, they're actually um, sort of control registers for different things uh, on the Game Boy. So they control various um, things about, for instance, how the LCD is set up. So if it's uh, and, and the screen in general. So if it's going to show backgrounds or if it's going to show also sprites, um, uh, it will allow us to set interrupt flags for if we want to take an interrupt on a certain event. Um, there are many things here. They're all things to do with anything to do with video memory, anything to do with uh, audio, anything to do with um, 
reading the joypad, for example, all of that stuff is kind of done with the IO registers. So that's kind of a region of things that are there and they're all well defined and you, if you read them right in a certain way, then they should work. Then you have 126 bytes of high RAM. So this is RAM that's just high in the address space. And it's pretty much just used for the stack. So high RAM is um, where the stack is by default. And uh, it's also used in another very specific exception. And I'll explain that when we get to it in the code. But uh, there are some specific things that happen with something called DMA, which is um, an automated process of moving memory around. Um, during a DMA transfer, uh, you can only access high RAM. So there is a certain sort of number of clock cycles that the only place you can read or write from is this high RAM region. And that includes uh, where the next instruction comes from. <laughs> so that has to be done correctly uh, in that case as well. And then the final two bytes are the interrupt enable register. So that is the global interrupt unmaskable uh, or the, the global interrupt enable mask. So if we set interrupts off there, it doesn't matter how we configure them in the IO registers. Um, they're, they're going to be off. You're not gonna get the interrupt. And uh, we probably won't talk too much about interrupts in this uh, video because I don't make use of them in the block jump game, but they are very useful for doing kind of graphical effects and various things with uh, audio and that kind of stuff. All right, so that is the memory map. And I hope you're still with me at this point because it's quite important to have an understanding about this. The memory map sort of represents the hierarchy and um, the capabilities of the Game Boy hardware itself. And if you understand a little bit about how memory is laid out and what reading and writing from different parts of it uh, will actually do in terms of the hardware of the Game Boy, then that gives you a big sort of leg up on understanding how some of the code behaves. So the next thing I wanna do is actually move into the actual code of the game and what we'll do is we'll fire up an emulator and a debugger in the emulator and we'll sort of step through various parts of the code and we'll see some of the interesting subsystems. So let's take a look at that. Okay, so let's kind of start off with a, an overview of the program, uh, the whole game as it were. And the game goes through basically a couple of small phases. There is a kind of setup phase where we're just getting the hardware uh, ready and kind of moving things between different areas of memory ready to sort of get into the game and then we kind of set up all the game objects themselves um, that kind of initialize the data structures in RAM and then finally there is the phase where the game loop takes place and the game loop is a kind of state machine where we just sort of loop forever in various states and execute logic in those. So we'll just sort of get a, an overview of that and then we'll dive in deeper into some of the other systems like the graphics and the game state machine itself, physics and collision, RNG and compression. All right, so we start out here um, uh, basically setting this register to zero. I believe this register is the audio and we're basically, uh, is to do with the audio and the audio subsystem. Uh, I'm not sure if I, yes, there is actually a file called hardware inc and I have a uh, hardware inc.ts in here. And the hardware inc is quite a famous community driven um, include file that's used in various uh, assemblers and assembly projects. And it lays out basically a lot of constants and addresses and uh, offsets and that kind of thing that are very common in the Game Boy. So you'll see here I've taken some of them, just enough actually to build the very basic demos that I've made uh, in Tega and uh, this game, Block Jump. Um, so what you'll see here is we have addresses for things like VRAM, um, for various, uh, well, this is called screen here. It's to do with um, uh, tile maps. We have where RAM begins, where the RAM bank begins, where OAM begins, where the IO registers begin, and uh, various things like P1 is to do with input, and we have various uh, things here to read uh, bits of that register and we have uh, some constants here that are to do with 
uh, how we actually get input and we'll probably see this uh, a little bit later on but uh, yeah we've got some stuff to do with the LCD and and down here uh, this is this register that we're setting and basically I believe and I don't remember exactly now but I believe this is an audio enable register or it at least one of the bits enables audio and what we're doing is just turning all audio off because this game doesn't have any audio and on the real hardware you can actually save quite a bit of battery life by just turning off the audio subsystem when you're not using it so that's what I've done here and I've just copied this out of other example projects that I've seen so then the next thing that we're doing is we're uh, calling into this standard library function wait for vblank now the reason we want to wait for vblank is because we actually want to do some stuff to do with the LCD screen itself and you can't it's very bad <laughs> in terms of the Game Boy to do anything with the LCD while you're not in vblank um, if for instance you try to turn the LCD off while you're not in vblank you can actually do real damage to the Game Boy so if you're going to play around with this stuff make sure you do a little bit of reading uh, around kind of the conventions of programming um, follow the conventions that you see in code because some of them are there to protect the hardware. Now, there aren't that many things uh, that you can do that might damage the Game Boy, but there are a couple in, in that kind of sense. And so this is one of them. If in doubt, just wait for a V-blank. <laughs> so V-blank, how do we even wait for V-blank? I mean, that might be worth taking a look at. Notice that all this function here does is uh, insert an assembly instruction to call wait for V-blank. So let's take a look at wait for V-blank. So this is a function, and this function fn uh, is part of the standard library as well, and basically it creates a block here, um, and it inserts a return instruction at the end of the block, and it gives you access to various labels. So you'll notice that you don't just put an array of instructions here, you actually create a function, you have a function that um, you get some arguments, and then you return uh, an an, in, an array of assembler operations. So what we have here is a symbolic label of the start of this function. So that saves us, you know, just creating a label here or creating a, um, uh, a, a scoped context in which we can create a start label. We don't have to do any of that because we have that here. And actually, if we uh, check um, the other arguments that we can be passed here, we can receive an end or uh, an end symbol and a size symbol and you might wonder like how is it possible that um, how is it possible to know the size of the block if you haven't actually created it yet and it's kind of a trick that the assembler is basically doing um, where the assembler is only filling in all of these symbolic values when it has passed the entire program and kind of already laid it um, laid it out in the kind of memory space in a buffer, then it goes back in and it fills in those values. Um, and if it can't find certain values, then you get error messages thrown. So it's quite a nice, uh, quite convenient system to allow you to sort of inject these kind of variables that actually haven't been resolved yet, but will eventually be resolved in the future. So all we're doing here is we're loading up um, a, a register called ly and the ly register is a, an it's an lcd type register so if we go here and i go to the definition you'll see that it's at ff44 uh, it's related to a few other ones that are related to the screen um, so we have the scrolling y register the scrolling x register uh, the window registers, I don't make any use of the window here, but it's an interesting rendering uh, aspect of the, the Game Boy. And finally, the LY register, it, this register basically tracks which line we're drawing on the um, on any given frame. And uh, that goes from, uh, from 1 down to 144, I believe. And so what we want to do is we want to check, are we on line 144? And while we're not on line 144, uh, we're jumping back to the start. So we're basically waiting until we get to line 144, and that tells us that we've started vblank. And uh, the way that this is working is actually, I think we'll find ourselves here any moment that we're in the vblank, um, because we're doing the compare on the carry. But 
this will work. This will basically allow us to figure out when we're at V blank and do something then, which could be potentially dangerous. And in this case, that is turning off the LCD. So what we do is we uh, put a zero in the A register and we write that to the LCD address. Now there are a couple of other things in the LCD, uh, a couple of other things in the LCD uh, register, but we're just setting it all off uh, for the moment. So then um, we can do some things with VRAM as well at this time because VRAM is accessible. So one of the things we can actually do is to copy tiles out of the, um, the ROM and into uh, VRAM. And we kind of, this isn't strictly necessary what I'm doing here. I'm copying tiles into multiple regions, um, but there are multiple places where you can reference tiles from. I'm just putting them in both so that it's it's just easier to reference them in other places. And for that, I'm calling this built-in standard function memcopy. Now these tiles, they actually come from um, this exported module here, uh, tiles. And uh, what we have is um, essentially no code. This is only uh, data that we're inlining to the ROM. So what I'm actually doing here is I'm reading in these uh, tile data binary files, and they're actually here in in this um, uh, directory. And so I have one for the, the tile data itself, and then I have one for the title tile map. So that just lays out the, the title screen. I have one for the game map that lays out kind of the whole game uh, area that we saw in the beginning and there's one for the game over screen which is quite similar to the title screen um, now the title data that's actually just uh, purely read as a binary file and uh, if I just do an LSA down here on source uh, block jump tile data we can see that the tile data itself is 432 bytes. So we're reading sort of <clears throat> just under half a kilobyte straight away and injecting that directly into the ROM with no compression. <clears throat> However, the title, uh, the tile maps here, so the, the title map and the tile map and the game over map, each of those is 1K. And that is because a tile map actually contains 32 by 32 um, uh, individual descriptions of a tile. <clears throat> now, this is a little bit of a strange thing because the Game Boy doesn't um, doesn't have a 32 by 32 tile uh, screen size, but you can actually draw the map uh, beyond the width of the screen, and that allows you to kind of scroll things around uh, in both the X and the Y direction and create kind of um, yeah, a lot more uh, sense of movement and you can do some interesting things in that. And that's how you can create kind of scrolling platformer games. Um, you don't constantly have to kind of race and throw tiles at the end of the, the thing. You can sort of load up tiles that are just ahead of you and scroll the map. And as you kind of run out, then you can load new tiles onto the end. But that's not done in this case. Uh, there's no dynamic tile loading except for when you have to change between screens. Um, but yeah, you'll notice that these ones are run length encoded and we're gonna get to that later, but basically what we're doing is reading this raw data. So this is a raw description of the tiles and this is just 32 by 32 bytes. So 1024 bytes and each byte is basically referencing one of these possible tiles. Um, and inside the tile data, uh, I don't remember exactly, there are 432 bytes in this and each tile is 16 bytes, so there are 27 tiles in, um, in this game. And so we're basically pointing at one of those 27 tiles in each of those bytes. So yeah, it's quite, uh, and well, a lot of them are repeated, so it's a, good opt uh, it's, a it's a good candidate for compression and kind of size optimization there because we can only store at least in this uh, in this iteration of Tega, we can only store 32 kilobyte ROMs. And if you're spending already three kilobytes of your space on tile maps, and maybe you know in the future you might want to do something more advanced and kind of as the level progresses, you might want to kind of change background and 
uh, and intensities and maybe do more dynamic things, then that's going to quickly uh, eat into your budget of, of sort of how much logic you can really put into the game. So this is a, a pretty good candidate for that. And I'm doing a trick here um, to actually make the, the tiles representable inside the, the game ROM. And that is I'm putting them inside a block. And a block is just like a function that we saw in the, uh, in the previous thing when we looked at memcopy. It's just like a function, but instead of, uh, it doesn't have to insert a return in instruction at the end. But what it does allow us to, to do is to, for instance, reference the fact that the tile has an end and a start and a size. And that's pretty useful when we actually want to copy um, those bytes around because we can reference its size and its start position. So we can pass those things to these memcopy calls and say, this is our, our sort of source, this is our destination, and this is the number of bytes that we want to copy. So that makes that really convenient. And that's why um, we stuff these inline bytes into a block. It doesn't cost anything in the game itself. This is purely an assembler construction, uh, but it's pretty useful in that sense. And then this is a pattern that I use all over the, um, the game itself uh, in every sort of module, so to speak. So every file that does something individual, um, I export a constant that sort of packs together the, all of the data that needs to go in the ROM uh, for this part. So what we're doing here is just inlining uh, all of the, uh, the actual bytes that make up uh, these sections. So that is what is inside this block. It's a compound operation that just contains the bytes. Um, and then it's easy to import at the bottom of the file here. We can see that at some point I stuff that tile data in somewhere in the ROM at the end. Okay, so that's kind of the tiles that I'm not going to go too much more into that for now until we actually get into the compression part. Um, but that's kind of the, the graphical aspect and there's some loading and uh, sort of setting up the screen that we need to take a look at. But once we've actually copied the tiles in, uh, you'll see that there's this call to um, RLE unpack. RLE stands for run length encoding and it's a type of compression. And so basically this is unpacking that compression. So we are starting at the tile map here and we want to unpack into this section and we are uh, the size of the unpacking, so to speak, is the size of the title map. Now, this is after compression. So this is the compressed size that we're passing. That's not the size that it will expand into. It's going to expand into a larger size, in this case, one kilobyte. And then we are going to copy the DMA routine to HRAM. Now, I mentioned this briefly earlier, but there is a very nice feature of the Game Boy, which is the, the OAM, which represents our sprites, we have 40 possible sprites, and we only have a small window in which to actually copy those bytes over. And copying um, 40, uh, 40 sprites, each of which is four bytes, that actually takes you know a non-insignificant non amount of the budget that you have in VBlank, right? You don't have a whole lot of time to do this copying procedure, and you might actually need to do some other kinds of logic that deal with VRAM, uh, like moving tiles around. So in order to optimize this, um, the Game Boy has something called DMA, and the DMA allows you to copy those OAM tiles faster um, without having to manually write the assembly instructions to do that. And the caveat here is that while that DMA routine is running, um, you can't access anything but the HRAM, the high RAM. And so we actually need to copy the DMA routine to high RAM. So let's actually take a little look at this because this is a point of interest in itself. And I think it actually really well highlights one of the cool features of Tega that I haven't seen so much in other assemblers. Um, okay, so the, the DMA routine, I've kind of tried to um, annotate some of these functions with a sort of C style, sort of GCC uh, style function signature. So this one is sort of like a void function uh, called initiate DMA, and we're gonna call that. And we've annota I've annotated it with this attribute which says it's a RAM function. So what that means is that um, when I generate this function, 
these labels here, this label weight, and uh, the, you know, there's a there is a whole um, uh, loop that's going on here. I want this to be generated so that these labels point to RAM. I don't want them to point to ROM. And the problem is that if I have to assemble the code, the assembler by default is going to put these in ROM. And actually the function is going to end up in ROM. We have to manually copy it to RAM. And that's what this uh, function below does. That just calls memcopy. Uh, but when the function is in RAM, I want these this function to refer to this place in RAM, not in ROM, where it actually gets assembled. And the way that we deal with this is to use something called a virtual offset. So what the virtual offset is, is basically a declaration here. Um, and we say that, hey, when you generate this function, or when I, when I sort of put this, um, whatever I have between this array, which is my set of assembler operations here, and in this case, it's just gonna be sort of a function definition, Whatever I put in here, if there's a label inside or there's a symbolic reference to a label, um, make sure that you uh, you annotate that according to this virtual offset. So the virtual offset begins at HRAM, which begins at uh, 65K up high somewhere in the FF something something space. Um, and yeah, so basically create these symbols as if we were starting from this point. And the way that the virtual offset works is that inside the assembler, it keeps track of two offsets. One is where it's inserting bytes into the ROM space. So that starts at zero um, effectively. And every time you insert some instructions, you move that offset by the size of the instruction or the number of bytes that you've inserted. And it also keeps track of a virtual offset at the same time. And at the, at the beginning of the program, the virtual offset is just set to zero. And every time you add to the offset in the same way, the virtual offset is, is added to as well. So for every instruction, we move both offsets forward. And what we're doing in this case is we are explicitly telling the assembler that when it gets to this point in the program, when it's processing this DMA, uh, these DMA functions, which just get dumped into the main program at the bottom here, DMA functions. When it's processing that, it should set the virtual offset to HRAM. And so then, of course, this function is the first thing there. So it adds this function in, it moves the offset forward. It adds this fun uh, this instruction in, it moves the offset forward. And then when we come to a label, well, that label doesn't just doesn't point to the offset in the program now. It points to the virtual offset in the program. And so when it generates code down here that actually references that label, it's going to reference it in relation to the virtual offset rather than to the main offset. And that's a little bit of an in-depth way of basically saying that I want this function to pretend it lives in, a, in another place. And I'm gonna put that function in the place somewhere else. So this is kind of nice. Um, I've seen other people, uh, you, you actually don't have to do this. That's uh, kind of one of the funny things here. There is actually an instruction called jump relative. Um, and so you, in a jump relative instruction, of course, I could I could sort of calculate how far backwards I have to go and I could, I could uh, jump relative um, backwards a few bytes. And you could even, um, you know, put a label in here and jump relative to that label. And it's gonna kind of work out um, a relative offset between where the offset is now and the relative offset of the jump instruction. And so in that case, you also wouldn't need this. Um, but I wanted to put it in this program um, to show off this virtual offset feature. There are programs where it is really useful to be able to do this. And I've seen people write software that copies functions into RAM, and then they have to write a whole nother routine, which basically, searches through the function that they wrote in RAM and replaces bytes uh, to make sure that they match up with the correct uh, jump offsets. And that involves also having a bunch of tables in memory that say how big instructions are and that kind of thing. So this essentially just um, moves all that work to the assembler. It's something I'm quite uh, proud of in this way. But that's enough of that. Um, once we have copied the DMA routine, um, 
we can actually turn the LCD screen back on. And when we turn the LCD screen on, um, we turn it off with these uh, numerous flags. So if we go to the definition here, all of these LCDCF uh, uh, notes here are sort of things we can um, things we can all together. You can see each of them just take up a single bit. Um, or some of them are just zero when they are referring to something being off because it's kind of a symbolic way of saying this thing is off rather than actually doing anything of value. So here what we're actually doing is we're turning the LCD on and we're turning the background on. So we can render the background or uh, and the sprites kind of according to these flags that we set in this register. But I'm actually turning off objects, and objects is um, things that we put in OAM. These are the sprites. So by default, I'm turning the sprites off. And the reason is that um, I can actually set the sprites up uh, in the positions that they should be when the game starts. And that allows me to have everything ready so that when we uh, switch state into playing the game, um, I don't have to do all that work at that moment. And it's kind of a nice thing because um, while the LCD is off, um, you know, the, the character is basically waiting in position. And if, if we didn't have it on there, it would, uh, if we did, if we had LCD object on here, we would see that on the main screen, which could be a feature, but in this case, I didn't want to have that. So essentially we're turning the LCD back on at this point. And during the first frame, we can initialize all the display registers. So there's something called a palette. And I'm not going to go into too much detail here because this is actually a really confusing concept without having the right kind of uh, visual aids. And I don't have the right visual aids with me at the moment. But basically, um, when you describe tiles, um, they don't have fixed um, pixel colors. So the Game Boy only has four shades that it can display, right? It has four colors effectively. And one of those colors is kind of used as an alpha channel. So it really only has three colors. Um, but so you can imagine that for four colors, uh, you only need two bits to represent that. And for any given uh, tile that we're describing, we're basically going to use two bits at a time to represent what color that pixel is going to be. But we don't say the color explicitly. We refer to a palette index. And that's kind of what we're doing here. We're setting up the palette. So I'm saying that palette index, uh, uh, well, this, this starts from the, the low position. So we count this as being the zero thing. So palette index zero also represents the number zero. Palette index one also represents the number one. Palette index two represents two. And finally, palette index three is three. The reason that this is interesting is because you can change these around as the game is, uh, as the game is progressing. And it can make for some really interesting visual effects. So if you've ever seen kind of the water effects that you would see in like Pokemon or something like that, where you kind of these waves are sort of slowly moving over the screen, that is actually done as a palette effect. So you don't need to change any tiles. All you need to do is change this one byte every few frames. Um, and sort of you can rotate these numbers, for example. And if you draw your tiles correctly, you can actually get these nice visual effects. I haven't really made any use of that here. So I just set the palette up once and I leave it like that. But that is something I might explore in the future, doing some Game Boy demos if people are interested in this kind of thing. And then we can get into kind of those graphical effects and doing interesting things with the scrolling registers and interrupts to do things at different points in the frame. Okay, so there are actually two different palettes in the Game Boy, the original Game Boy. Um, there's a background palette and there's a separate object palette. So the sprites um, can have a different palette to the, um, to the background. Uh, okay, so I set them to the same because that made my life easier in this case. And then uh, we're zeroing out all of the RAM that we use. This is just typical program stuff. Like if you have some stuff in RAM, like the Game Boy, the physical Game Boy, um, when it boots up, it's going to have random values in um, in RAM, you know, or close to random values, uh, indeterminate at the very least. 
and you kind of don't want that like if you set up some if you've got a whole bunch of structures and things like that in ram that you've set aside uh, as kind of global variables then you don't want it to be full of random data you kind of want to zero all of that stuff out in the beginning and this happens at the beginning of every c program that you ever write or c plus plus or really any software um, the first step will be kind of going and zeroing out all of the uninitialized uh, or sorry the initial the uninitialized uh, variables that you have so this is a step that basically does that and it's probably a good moment to actually talk about the ram so there is a ram module here and i uh, i actually want to build something more um more permanent so to speak into tega that actually sort of takes charge of allocating ram for you but right now I've just written a sort of very simple way of allocating myself memory for this game. So I start with a RAM index of, well, the first address of RAM, and I keep track of where I am. And I call this function reserve RAM uh, with a number of bytes, and that basically moves the internal index forward. So as I ask for more bytes from RAM, it's sort of working out where those are gonna be. And so, for example, uh, here I've got some, well, we'll get to this part uh, shortly, but there is this concept of shadow OEM and uh, the character. And what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm allocating a certain amount of memory uh, that's going to live at this address. And then this address is going to end up being this RAM address. Uh, at that point so we we figure out that address in the beginning we move the offset forward and then we return it so this character shadow oem uh, which is made up of uh, four bytes that's going to live at this address and then the next the next thing that i allocate after that is going to be at c004 so this basically is allocating a certain amount of ram for the same amount of size as OAM, uh, which is a, a region that's kind of effectively like VRAM, but is not actually part of VRAM. So the reason is that you can use this DMA routine to copy your OAM data into uh, the actual OAM at the right moment, because there is a very limited time which you can actually update OAM. And if you update OAM in the wrong time, it can either not work or you can end up with weird graphical effects. So then there's also um, a whole bunch of things here. Like I've got this idea of structs. So there's a character struct, for example, and that keeps track of some character information like the state that the character is in, the Y velocity, the gravity, the weight time, uh, some various ver uh, values that are to do with kind of physics and the jumping. And then at the end, uh, there's a size, and this is just taking advantage of sequential enum uh, values. All of these are one byte values. And so the, the last one just dictates the size. Uh, it's a convenient way of representing this in this program. It's sort of, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a side use, let's say, of TypeScript enums. So, but in the end, that, that lets us uh, have this character struct and it's this uh, six byte wide structure. And then here I've just made a simple function that if I ask for one of the properties of that character struct, it just will always give me the address symbol, which is the address of the character struct plus this offset that I get from the character struct itself. So this is the convention I've used to set up my um, my global variables in RAM, kind of the, the things that I've set up in, in, the, in the program. And there are a whole bunch of them. So there are things to do with physics. There are things to do with the obstacles themselves, uh, which also have their own structs. Um, I have one for the background weight, which is something we'll talk about a little bit later, one for the game state, and one for the RNG, uh, something that's done with the RNG. And then finally, at the end, we export the very last RAM index and I also export all of the symbols so that I can put them together with the symbols I get from the assembler and have some nice representation in the debugger. Um, yeah, and so what's actually happening here is we're just looking at the beginning of RAM and uh, the, the amount of RAM that we use and we're zeroing it out. So that's how that works. 
Uh, then we're going to set up some OEM values. And I'm going to go through this a little bit quicker now. This is essentially just setting up um, the character's position and all of those physics variables in the beginning. And the way that I actually do this is that I load the address into these, the HL pointer. And you'll recall that the HL pointer can be used as this incrementing uh, pointer that each time I read or write from it, I can also increment the pointer at the same time. So this is a useful way of kind of setting up each value uh, sequentially uh, in, in very few instructions. So um, there is this function that I've set up. It's called set OEM entry values. And basically to that function, I pass a Y position, an X position and a tile number. And those all end up in the, in the right positions in their OAM slot. Uh, we're setting up the obstacles. The obstacles themselves also have a struct, so maybe it's useful to just keep an eye on that, but we'll talk about that part shortly. But basically in the obstacle, an obstacle can be active or inactive. Um, so there's a certain amount of time that the obstacle will become inactive for before it becomes active again. So it doesn't go off one side of the screen and immediately pop back on the other because it kind of feels better if it doesn't, um, if there's some amount of time there. So sometimes you'll have longer gaps between seeing an obstacle, sometimes you'll have very short gaps. There's an update timer, which is basically just to do with how often we're actually updating the, the, the obstacle itself. Each obstacle has a type. <clears throat> As you've seen in the game that you can have short obstacles, you can have big obstacles. And so um, the type basically influences that. There's a cooldown timer that's to do with um, uh, how long it stays inactive for. And there is an OAM index. And the OAM index basically points at the first OAM entry that this obstacle takes up. So if an obstacle actually has four tiles, um, four or five tiles or however many, there's actually four tiles per obstacle. Um, this points to the first uh, tile in that case. And so there are some tricks that I've done here which are actually not efficient in terms of memory usage, but are efficient in terms of how easy it is to then do the programming for it. Um, and maybe I'll show you some of that complexity and we'll skip over some of it as well. And the last thing I do is I keep track of the Y height of this obstacle because it becomes very easy to look it up uh, during all the physics routines. Although, as I've mentioned in this note, um, that information is available somewhere else in the ROM as well. And so I have this information in a kind of double format. The only problem is that the, the second format requires a lot more kind of going through and calculating and looking up a value somewhere else. And so in order to avoid all of that complexity, I just also store it here. Um, yeah, so that's kind of it for the obstacles. We set them up in the same way. We load up the, well, the HL pointer is, in the beginning, it points at the character. It's the very first OAM entry. And then after that is just obstacles. So basically once we've set up the character, setting up um, the obstacles themselves is, is pretty straightforward. <coughs> and what this does is just inserts uh, two obstacles. So there are two obstacles in the game and they kind of move backwards and forwards and get and jump in front of each other uh, as their various timers get in and out of sync with each other. Uh, and that creates kind of uh, the effect of uh, not having a fixed pattern of how these come in. And the random number generator is also involved in that. So there are two obstacles, there could be more, but I set two up in this game. Um, then we're setting up the actual character struct itself that represents a whole bunch of stuff to do with the character and the physics. So we use the HL pointer trick and we start loading values in. So first we load in the state, which is idle. And there are various states that the character can be in. It can be in idle, jumping or falling. And we start in idle, which means we're on the ground. Uh, and then what we do is we set zero to the Y velocity, gravity, jump amount and jump timer. We'll see what those do later on. Uh, then we set up the obstacle properties. So both obstacles, as well as having their OAM entry, uh, they also have their own properties. We talked about that. And so that's what is happening here. And you'll see that the first obstacle, 
uh, has its OAM index pointing at 1 and the second obstacle has it pointing at 5 and that's because both obstacles have four entries in OAM uh, because they potentially have four tiles uh, of height. And yeah, you'll see that the, uh, the second obstacle uh, also has starts with a cooldown timer of 30, whereas the first obstacle starts with a cooldown timer of zero because we set this XOR A and A at this point, And so it ends up with a cooldown timer of zero. And this is kind of a nice thing. It just means that the first uh, obstacle will always roll in and then the second one will always come out a little bit later. So we don't kind of have to, uh, yeah, worry about like those two things kind of coming out together at once. I mean, that, that would be possible at they're in the same position and so it looks like the same obstacle. But I set this up so that they come out staggered. And then finally, um, we set up the random number generator table. And so I'm actually going to talk about that in a second, but uh, it's basically this is seeding it in a in a what I think is an interesting way. What I do is I read an uninitialized value from RAM, and in a lot of emulators and also in the physical hardware, um, they will start with RAM in a random order, in a kind of with random values. So by by reading here, I'm actually setting up a random index. Uh, for the random number generator. And we'll see how that actually works a little bit later. This is the seeding process. Then there is the, the game loop. And the game loop is really straightforward. Basically, it calls this state machine function, which updates the game. Um, we wait for a, a V blank. We initiate the OAM uh, copy routine. And then we jump back to the game loop unconditionally. So we're always, like from now on, we're just in an infinite loop here and we go through the various states that we can be in. And then everything that comes after are just uh, uh, the various functions that come from all the different modules and the bits of data that we have uh, around. And then in the end, we just uh, do some building of the ROM, uh, printing some uh, information about the ROM usage and the RAM usage. Uh, of course, you can actually if you're keeping track of how much RAM you allocate, you can also feed back on the amount of RAM that you're using. And so you can get an idea of like, am I running out of RAM? Uh, am I going to need to kind of figure out if I can squish some of this data together? And of course, when I built this game, I didn't get anywhere near the limits of either of ROM or RAM. But I did enjoy employing the techniques of um, figuring out the the sort of old school space saving ways of doing things. Although in a lot of places I I could have done better in that, that respect. Um, so I'm also just squeezing those RAM symbols into a symbol file and we'll see that in a little bit as well. But uh, yeah, this basically just allows us to see the various symbols. If we reference them by address, that address will be replaced with the name of something. So it's useful to see uh, um, a symbol name in that respect. And that could be improved as well because all of the symbol names just point, they, they only reference the first address. So if I have a, a structure, so to speak, that has six entries, um, it's I'm not gonna see uh, a useful label for the second entry, for example. Okay, let's go to the RAM, uh, the RNG usage, because I think that's a relatively straightforward thing, but also kind of, kind of nice. When I was thinking about how to do random number generation for this game, I went through several um, possibilities in my mind. Um, at first, I had the idea of using a linear feedback shift register, which is something that a lot of old games did. It's relatively easy to set up, even on 8-bit machines like the Game Boy. Um, but after doing it and kind of struggling to get it to work nicely and uh, kind of bumping up against like the, the expressiveness of assembly on the Game Boy, I kind of came to a simpler solution, which um, I, it works really well. And I'm surprised at how well it works. But the solution is just generate a random table ahead of time. Of course, <laughs> if you have um, enough space left in, in ROM, and if you have 256 uh, bytes left over in your ROM, just generate a table ahead of time. And I, I just used this command on Linux. So I just grabbed some bytes from uRandom. I got 256 of them. And then I piped it through XXD to actually 
present this output and I pasted it directly into the program. And so this is not a, a random number generator that features potentially like every byte. So that, you know, maybe some numbers here are actually overrepresented. But the way I actually use the random number generator in this game is that I will ask for a random number and then I will mask off some bits because I actually only want a number that's between one and four, let's say, or one, well, not in one and four would not work in this case, but let's say one and three um, or one and eight. And so what I can do is I can just mask off the portion that I'm interested in. And if I'm do, sort of doing that um, enough, eventually what's going to happen is, you know, I might end up wrapping back around again, but if I'm not asking for the same sort of, I'm not trying to get a random number for the same thing at that point. If basically, if I'm not synchronized in the thing I'm asking for and the number of times that I loop back around, I can get a lot of different random values out of this table, enough that it doesn't seem predictable. So I'm actually really happy with this solution. Obviously, if you needed this quarter of a kilobyte back, then uh, this is not going to be the best way. But uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm kind of happy with it. Um, so all that happens actually in the get random function, so there is a kind of get random function. Uh, what I actually do is I just load up the, um, the, the address of the table into HL and I uh, load into A the address of the random index that I'm keeping track of in RAM. And that's the thing that I randomly assigned from memory here. Um, Basically, I, I pull one, uh, well, I have to offset that pointer. So there's a way of, uh, there's a function here called apply offset to HL pointer, which basically just adds the number in A to HL. It's kind of a convenience thing there because you have to do it in a loop um, because you can't add um, directly. Although I think now I think about that, I could have done that probably in a smarter way, but this works fine. Um, so basically what I'm doing is I'm adding the index here and then just loading whatever is at that index into A um, and incrementing the, the, table, uh, the table index afterwards. So this is kind of a thing that you know moves through this table linearly and wraps around afterwards. And I just read the byte that's at the index anytime I'm asking for a random number. And of course, if enough places in the program are asking for random numbers, then you're not gonna kind of sync up again. So that's how that works. I'm actually really happy with, with how that uh, worked out. So next, I think the an interesting thing to talk about will just be the game state machine because you've seen how the game looks and it's pretty simple. Um, so taking a look at the game state machine, this is the function for the game state machine. So what it does is it loads up the game state from RAM. Um, so we keep that uh, there. And the game state, if we open up this um, structs thing, just like the character can be in the idle jumping and falling state, well, the game itself can be in the title, main, or game over state. So it can only be in those three possible states. So what I'm actually doing here is I'm sort of switching on a register. And this, again, is a sort of macro. Uh, in the program terms, I supply a register and then I can supply a list of cases to match against. And in the case that the A register matches the uh, the game title state, then I just call the game title function. And I do this for all three of the states. And this switch reg is a macro that I've written, which is based on the if equals macro, which of course is itself just based on generating the right instructions for um, uh, generating the right instructions for doing a compare and a, and a jump. So we can end up with the expressiveness of switch just from uh, having a decent macroing system uh, with a general purpose programming language. So this starts to get towards why I think this is a good idea. And I'm very happy with the way that this works. These uh, game state functions are not anything particularly uh, intense. Of course, the the main game itself, that actually is the most uh, sort of interesting of all of them. But in the title screen, 
all we're really doing there is um, you know displaying the tiles that are in the title map we're not changing anything um, we're just waiting for the, the user to press start and the way in which we do that is we read from this particular register so there is this PF uh, um, Sorry, there is this register called uh, P1, like the player one, I guess, or pad one. I'm not sure what that particularly stands for. But what we do is we, um, into that register, we load this uh, pattern of bits, which is the, the get buttons. So we're basically, basically telling this register, this piece of hardware that we're gonna request the buttons. And then we actually have to read from that register again to get the buttons afterwards. And you can read either the buttons, which includes the A button, the B button, the start and select, or you can read the D-pad, uh, which gives you, of course, the directions of the D-pad. You can't read both at once. Um, so in this case, I'm reading the buttons. Um, you actually have to sort of submit your request uh, first. So you load that into uh, this address. And then again, I'm loading from memory. So this is another macro that basically allows you to arbitrarily read into different registers. I'm loading from memory into the B register, whatever is now at that address. And so after you make a request, when you read again, you get the sort of response, so to speak. And what you can do is uh, you can just directly end with the bit pattern of um, the start button. So there is a particular bit in this in this register that will represent start or select or A or B or various directions on the D-pad if that's what you request uh, requested. And the way that it's kind of got active low logic. So that means that if the button is pressed, um, you get a zero in this uh, position. So we can just check for zero. And then if it's zero, uh, that means that we're going to move to the game state. So we just wait for a V blank routine, turn off the LCD, and then uh, unpack the tiles that represent the main game. And then we turn the LCD back, back on, this time with background and objects on, so with the sprites on. And then we just change the game state to be main, and we uh, load that back into the register, and then we basically return from this function. And the switch statement, um, it doesn't have any fall through. It's not like C, it doesn't, you don't fall through if you don't break. So this will basically return from the game state function and we'll come back for another round of the loop. Um, and during the, the next round of the loop, we'll actually enter the game, the main game function. And this is an interesting thing. I didn't realize uh, the first time around when I wrote this, when I wrote the game, um, I'd, I'd written, initially without a game state machine i just wrote the game code itself so every time you would boot the game on you would immediately go into the game and have to start jumping and when i came when it came time to sort of put the start and the end screen on uh, the title and the game over i thought it was going to be a really straightforward uh, operation and what i found is that when i tried to um, change the tile map from the title screen to the main game it was leaving large chunks of the uh, of the title screen on the screen, and this was happening in both the um, the emulator and the the hardware itself. So I knew that this was a problem on my end. And the actual issue there is that, um, like I said, you can only access certain regions of memory during certain um, uh, certain times. So, for instance, V blank, but V blank is only so long. So if you're trying to access, um, if you're trying to unpack your tile map during V blank, it's actually gonna take you a couple of frames in order to do that. And if you don't turn off the LCD, then you don't have free reign access to VRAM. And therefore, when you try to write certain bytes in, they're just gonna be ignored. And so I was ending up with this very strange graphical glitch. So. That was a learning experience for me. If you want to kind of change the tile map in a big way, if you want to load a complete new tile map on, um, especially if you're going to do something like the run length encoding, um, because uh, that's going to require some extra processing as well that a regular mem copy wouldn't, but a regular mem copy will also likely take a couple of frames. Well, in that case, yeah, uh, you need to turn off the LCD and turn it back on again.
but it's not something that you actually see while you're playing, so uh, it works fine. All right, so that's just a, a little interesting tidbit. The game over screen works very, very similarly. Uh, it's basically waiting for an input and then going back to the main game state. Once you've um, moved out of the title screen, you never see the title screen again. You just go between the main game and uh, game over. And in the main game, um, this is where we do the majority of the, the, the sort of primary interesting game logic. So one of the things that I did just at the very end was to add a little bit of a um, <clears throat> one small amount of graphical interest into the game. And that is that I actually scroll the background um, uh, from, from right to left uh, in a rotating way. And it's a very subtle thing because um, you actually, it only happens every five frames and the background only scrolls by one position. So um, what actually happens is the background uh, is very, very slowly moving and the obstacles are moving in front of it much quicker. So you get a nice kind of parallax effect that seems like you're moving through the world rather than the character standing still and uh, just, just jumping at obstacles that sweep from the screen from right to left. So that actually made a big difference in terms of the visual appeal. And the way that that actually works is that you can just, um, uh, well, of course, what I actually do is I, you know, I load up the background weight register, I increment it and I write it back and I check if we exceeded the, the timer, like the maximum wait time, which is five frames. And if it did exceed five frames, well, then I set it back to zero and I use this uh, little function that, or this little macro that I've written called read, modify, write, which is basically a nice way of um, saying, I want to read this address into this register and I'm going to do some body that changes it. And then I want you to write it back this register into this address. So it's just a, a useful little way of saying, I'm going to modify something and it's going to go through this register what's really important is kind of what's happening in here and not so much the mechanics of loading something out and loading it back. So I kind of encompassed it into this read, modify, write. Uh, then we update the obstacles. Um, so there's a function called move obstacles and it's not a particularly uh, advanced function. It's essentially just uh, loading up that obstacle um, and it's kind of representing struct and figuring out like, is this, ob is this active? Um, if it's active, I should uh, move it across the screen a little bit. <coughs> and if it's gone off the end of the screen, well, it should become inactive and it should go through a cooldown period and uh, eventually come back up. And the move obstacles code is kind of the hairiest code in this, um, it's the hairiest code in this whole uh, <laughs> part. Basically, it's one big function with a lot of if else's and um, I want to refactor it, uh, but I also at the same time don't want to refactor it, if you know what I mean. I don't really want to go in there and start pulling all this logic apart, but uh, it certainly could be done. And I, if I was going to work on this anymore, um, I'm kind of done with it for now. <laughs> but if I was going to work on it anymore, then I would probably go in and clean that up as one of the immediate next actions. Um, but that has one function, so um, we load in the obstacle address into the DE register pair and then call this move obstacles function and that knows that that address is going to be in DE, so it uh, does things from there. So I can use the same function for both obstacles. And then uh, physics gets evaluated. <coughs> and there's actually a little bit of a... Um, uh, there's a little bit of a... Um, Uh, kind of finesse to the way that this works, that physics is actually not updated every frame. It's updated uh, every two frames. Um, and it can be updated immediately on every frame if the character is in the idle state. So kind of what happens here is that there is um, a value in C, which is representing kind of should eval physics. And if... Um, if we haven't updated physics for two frames, then yes, we can update physics. We can we can write a one into this address. Um, but also if the character is in idle, 
then we can also update physics immediately. And the reason that I do this is because the physics code is the one that actually is going to respond to a button press input. And I want that to feel really, really smooth. I don't want it to feel like there's any lag when pressing the, the, the jump button. Uh, and this just avoids that. So if the character in, is in idle, that's the only time that they can actually press jump um, and immediately begin a jump. Um, once you're in jump, you can continue holding jump and you will continue ascending up until a certain point. But uh, this basically will allow you to respond instantly, so to speak. Um, and so one of the things we actually do in this is when we realize that we need to update the physics, we read in uh, the value of the A button, and I actually write that into a RAM address. And the reason that I don't just put it into a, a register or something and then jump into physics is because there's a lot of things that kind of happen in the physics code before you even start, you know, reading the input and so it's easier to just sort of dump it somewhere in RAM first and then come back to it later uh, uh, and you actually want to do it in the moment right you don't you don't want to uh, you know this can potentially take some some time to run so you want to get the the input as it is right now rather than as it is later on so let's take a look at the physics um, the physics are if you've ever worked on uh, any kind of platforming type game or any really any game where you have dynamic movement what you generally implement is kind of a very simple uh, kind of approximation of physics <laughs> which is that you your character has a position and your character has a velocity and an acceleration at any given moment and during the course of the game logic you will accumulate values into the acceleration and then you will add it to the player's velocity at the end and then you will reset the acceleration um, so kind of you calculate acceleration on a per per frame basis let's say and then your velocity is something that is persisting across multiple flame frames and then at some moment you'll have other kinds of forces which are reducing your velocity, things like friction or air resistance or whatever your opposing forces happen to be that are actually bringing your, your, uh, your velocity back down to a sort of set point so that you're not able to infinitely jump, for example. So an example in jump physics is that you'll have gravity added uh, to your acceleration or your velocity rather um, across across frames and of course actually what will happen is you'll have gravity added to your acceleration and that will get added to your uh, velocity and then eventually your velocity is added to your position so you have kind of this three-step uh, process in this game uh, you have your velocity and your position so there's no kind of in-between acceleration that kind of just happens as is and the velocity is almost you know set and reduced and it's a very simplified version of what, what you might think of as physics. Uh, so what we have in here is I sp I've broken the physics down into multiple, uh, multiple different functions. And there is a jump physics uh, state machine, essentially, also with a switch statement that basically says if we're idle, we're going to do the idle stuff. And here we're actually checking a certain timer to see if we should evaluate physics uh, um, uh, the physics eval timer uh, here it actually loads it up resets it and writes it back i'm not actually sure if this is needed but i'm not going to touch it for now <laughs> and eventually at the end of any given physics update we're going to apply velocity so that's basically going to look at the character's velocity y velocity variable and add that to its position in oam Okay, so when we are in idle, we can potentially go and jump. So what we're doing here is when in idle, uh, y velocity should always be zero. So just setting that, making sure that that's the case, like you're not actually accelerating or moving in any way. Um, if the player jumped, uh, then we're gonna set the character state to jumping. 
we're going to set this jump timer to zero. And the jump timer is basically, it says how many frames we can be jumping for. Uh, there is a limit to the number of frames you can jump for. And we can set the jump amount according to the, the start amount. So when you start jumping, four pixels are immediately added. So a, a kind of acceleration of four units is added to your velocity at that moment. So that means that if you jump on one frame, the smallest obstacle is actually four pixels high. So you can actually um, do a one frame kind of response jump to uh, to a, an obstacle coming at you and you will immediately jump over that obstacle or at least you will jump over that obstacle if you don't let go and immediately start falling. So that is the idle part, it's quite straightforward. When you're jumping, uh, it basically outlines it here in this comment, but the player is jumping. Uh, there are a couple of things we need to think about. If the player is jumping, but they reach the maximum number of allowed frames, so you can only jump for so many frames, even if you keep holding the jump button. Uh, you can be jumping, but then on this frame, you happen to have released the jump button, in which case you should move to the falling state. And then we actually have sort of jump logic. So if you sort of made it through both of those and you didn't end up in the falling state, then you're going to do sort of the continued jump logic. So the first part is just checking, like, are you still jumping? Are we still holding the A button at this point? So that's what this part does. And if you're not, then it uh, will actually reset all of your values and put you in the falling state. If you've been jumping uh, longer than you're actually allowed to or the maximum amount of time, then we again do the same kind of thing. We reset the timer, we reset velocity, and uh, we return early and set the, the state to falling. Otherwise, we're incrementing this jump timer as we're going along. And then finally, the actual jump logic <coughs> is that we load up the jump amount so this is what we set to the value of four in the first uh, the first frame of jumping. And we're just incrementing it by one. So you actually only um, you only sort of gain one pixel of height per iteration after that. And it gets clamped to a maximum jump height value. And then that gets written back to the jump amount. And then we actually add that to your Y velocity. And if you think about it, right, and if you think about the coordinate system of the Game Boy, the top left of the screen is the zero, zero position. And the bottom right of the screen is kind of the maximum position in both axes. Not accounting for the fact that you can go off the side of the screen. So uh, as you move down from top to bottom, your Y position is increasing. So if we want to jump, we're somewhere uh, with a higher Y position down here, and we actually want to uh, move to a lower Y position, and that's what happens when we go up. So it's kind of inverted to what you might imagine that system of coordinates is, especially if you haven't done very much with games, because it's quite common for uh, zero, 0 to be in the top left position in a lot of sort of graphical uh, type of uh, coordinate systems. But we actually have to do a, um, uh, we have to make this a subtraction. And in order to make this uh, an easy subtraction, what I actually do is to, to invert this into a twos complement number. So the jump amount is currently in the A register. And I store that as a number that's going, you know, I'm jumping four units. So I want to keep track of it as four units. But what I do is at the last minute, I turn it into a negative number. So I'm going to turn it into minus four units. And the way that you do that is that you flip all of the bits and you add one, and that's two's complement. And if we do that and then add that to the Y velocity, or in this case, it sets the Y velocity, uh, then that's what's going to happen. Um, it's going to end up jumping upwards, but we still get to keep track of the timer uh, of the jump amount in the sort of positive axis. Um, and that's the end of the jump logic. The, basically, if you didn't change from uh, into the falling state, the next frame around, you're still going to be jumping. And so we're going to do all the same checks and we're going to add the same logic on again. And you're going to sort of end up jumping higher and higher. Um, and then finally, when you're falling, while this is just 
essentially adding adding gravity every frame so gravity is pretty similar gravity has a maximum value that it can pull you down by so the first thing to do is load it up increase it and clamp it to its maximum value then we can set the y velocity to be that that value and we calculate the next y position and the reason that we actually calculate the next y position even though that's something that happens when you add um, when you add y velocity on is we want to see if we hit the ground and if we did hit the ground we need to sort of snap the character's position to the ground and if you don't do this in this step you get this awkward kind of um, animation where the character falls falls below the ground and then snaps back up and that's not what I wanted so what I did was I added an additional check here to basically see if it fell through the floor and snap it back into position before that happens and of course if you hit the floor you just reset all of the values and you set um, the character state back to idle so that they can make another jump immediately and that is basically how that works there is an apply velocity function which just as it sounds applies the velocity that is all of physics uh, not not all of physics of course but uh, all of physics in this little micro world okay so the last thing that I actually want to talk about here is the compression because it's one of the coolest parts and one of the things that I was the most proud of in this even though it was completely unnecessary in the end um, I still found it to be a really interesting exercise so the way that that actually works is I'm using this technique called run length encoding and as I mentioned before and as I've mentioned in quite a few <laughs> quite a few videos actually if you've seen some of my most recent videos both of those uh, included run length encoding so it should be familiar to you but I've actually used an even more specialized version of run length encoding in this game so something that is not necessarily applicable to the next game that comes along because I've treated it to the conditions of this game um, which is again something that you might do in the era of few resources you don't necessarily want to have a general solution to something that is going to take more memory and more resources even though it applies to more problems you kind of might want to say well, I'd rather save a few bytes here save a few clock cycles and not be able to use this in my next game but get really good performance in this game uh, because that's going to make more sense in this case so those are the kind of trade-offs that you're looking at and the kind of trade-offs I enjoyed uh, enjoyed playing with so I think it's um it's useful to first look at the actual encoding mechanism rather than the decoding so let's let's take a look at that um, I wrote this in JavaScript. This function is not part of the assembler, of course. This is just a regular, uh, I say JavaScript, I mean TypeScript in this case. It amounts to the same thing. Um, this function, basically what it's doing is it's looking at the data inside any of these given tile maps. And let's actually take a look at what's inside a tile map. So I'll bring this up here and I'll open Bewitched. And we'll go to source block jump. Um, and let's look at the let's look at the title map. Uh, the tile data and the title map. So this is the title map. Um, and if I scroll down, you'll see that you know there's a bunch of data in here. And a lot of that data is just the number one. Um, and another thing that you will you will notice if you look at this is that none of these values exceed. Well, I mean, none of these values, I think, exceed the number uh, hex 11. I think that is perhaps the highest value in here, but certainly none of them use more than five bits. And that's really uh, interesting because what that means is that um, those, like if I'm never using the, the, the top three bits of an eight bit number, then I can use those three bits to represent something else in a decoding uh, algorithm. So what I can actually do, of course, run length encoding is a really simple form of compression. It's probably the simplest form. 
And what it basically says is, hey, I've got this byte. Okay, I'm going to put this into the program. Oh, wait, the next byte's the same. What if instead I just said I've got the previous byte two times? And so what we do is we count up the number of times we see the same byte again and again and again. And we can count up until 255 in, uh, well, in an 8-bit number. And so what I can do is I can use the first byte to say this is the byte of data that I'm going to encode. And the second byte says how many times I'm going to use that byte. So that is kind of a very optimal way of doing it. But of course, if you only use the byte once, right, if I if I come into this data somewhere and I see that um, so a pattern like this where I have 0, 1, 9, and then 2, well, I don't want to waste a byte after 9 saying that I have it one time. That's kind of a bit useless. And so I can take advantage of the fact that the data is structured in a way that it only uses 5 bits, and I can say that if I set the top bit of any given number that represents a tile, so say the number number one here, if I set the topmost bit, then that's going to indicate that there's going to be a run length encoding and that the next byte you read is going to say how many times that byte repeats. So this uh, one would actually look like 81 in the encoding because that eight is representing the the, the seventh bit, the, the most significant bit being set. And of course, when we get down to this nine, uh, we would not have a, a one in that position because we're just saying that this byte occurs just one time. So this is, without doing any kind of bit level compression, this is one of the most efficient kinds of compression that we can apply to this kind of data. And the reason that it isn't very applicable to the next project, of course, is because I might have many more tiles in the next project. And if I happen to have more than 128 tiles, then I can't use this mechanism. And it's going to be pretty probable that in a, a decent game with good graphics and not something like this, that you are actually going to have more than 128 tiles. But in any case, we can just do the encoding. And so it's kind of funny, like when I first when I first wrote this program, um, I actually wrote the encoder in Python, uh, just just for fun, why not? Um, I wrote the encoder in Python and I actually pre-encoded these binary data, uh, this binary data, and I realized like I'm not really taking advantage of the uh, macro assembler on steroids that is Tega, because what I can do in Tega of course is just run length encode the data after I've read it, and I can have all of that inside one big program, so I've got, you know, assembly programs and compression programs all working together in one thing. I don't have different tool chains. Um, so I rewrote it in JavaScript, and this is kind of the result. I'm not going to explain this in depth. It's basically counting the number of times we see a byte and then encoding it in this uh, with according to these set of rules that I've told you. And of course, if it sees a run that has more than 255, then it has to actually create a new run after that. So that's all this function does. Um, the actual interesting part is going to be the unpacking. So how do we do the inverse of that? And this function is basically a kind of um, inverse, well, a, a, an extended version of memcopy in a way. Because if you, if you feed non-run length encoded data into this function, it will actually just function as memcopy it will just execute as if it were memcopy. And that's kind of a nice thing that I realized at some point when I, when I, when I thought that I was going to be getting more compression out of my data. And I went to check and I saw, I'm calling RLE unpack, but I'm not packing the data beforehand. And I realized, wait, of course, this is just going to work for uncompressed data because uncompressed data is just going to appear as a tile that doesn't have the most significant bit set at any moment. And so you'll always end up in that kind of that path. Um, all right, so the way this works, and this function actually pushed me to a little bit close to the, uh, to, I had the goal of not uh, using any RAM addresses for this function. I didn't want to have to call into RAM. I wanted to have everything in the registers and I almost couldn't work out how to do it, which I feel kind of stupid about saying this, but this is one of those things that when you're figuring these functions out, 
um, in assembly, it can be kind of tricky. So I did have to use the stack, but I'm kind of okay with that. So what happens is that the DE register, just like in memcopy, the DE register represents the source address, the HL register represents the destination address, and the BC registers uh, represent the source size. So as you can see here, we've like we've used registers B, C, D, E, H, and L. So that actually only leaves A <laughs> as a usable register. Um, so that's not a lot. Uh, you've got one register to play with in this whole thing. Um, but there's a trick around it. So basically you can, uh, we don't need to look at the size all the time that we can look at the size kind of at the beginning and determine if we need to continue or not. But then for the rest of the function, we're not interested in it. So one of the things that we can do is, um, is just sort of store the size on the stack and pop it off later on. Basically what we do is we load a byte, uh, we back up the size, we back up the value of A in B, because now we've backed up the size, we have two additional registers, B and C, to play with. And we can actually uh, take a look and see if this is a single or a repeated byte. And the way that we do that is we just AND it with hex 80, that's gonna tell us if the most significant bit is set or not. And if it's zero, then that tells us that the top bit is not set, that it's just a single byte, and we should jump down to this label uh, here, single byte, which basically just does mem copy. Um, and if it's not though, we're gonna fall through and we're gonna be in this multi-byte area. And what we're gonna do is uh, get back the original uh, byte value. Uh, we're going to unset the top, the top bit. So there is this function, uh, sorry, there is this assembly instruction in, um, in the Game Boy called reset. This is one of the divergences between those other uh, possible similar architectures like Z80 and 8080. I, I think this is uh, Game Boy specific, although I'm not an expert, so I could be wrong about that. It has a couple of functions here uh, which uh, allow it to do some bit manipulation. So one of the things we can do is unset a bit. So we can unset bit seven of A, which basically removes that out. Now we just have the tile index we can write that byte uh, or copy it to B. Uh, we have to read the next byte. So we need to figure out, um, uh, we increment D and then we read from D into A and increment D again. So we're pointing at the next thing. <laughs> um, and then we do some register swapping and then eventually uh, we can loop through the number of times that we need to write this byte. And so between all of this, like pushing to the stack and swapping registers around and figuring all of this stuff out, this was basically where I figured out that I could do this just without uh, spilling spilling into RAM. Um, but yeah, this just unpacks uh, writes to the HL register with the value that of A, and then we're not changing A. We're writing the same byte a number of times. So this is just a loop that counts down a certain number of times and we have to check if we're done at all of these different points. And then eventually we jump down to check done and we jump back up to unpack the next byte. So we're unpacking kind of little sequences and a sequence could be a single byte or it could be a, a multi-byte run. So that's kind of the last part of this that I really wanted to uh, show. I do just wanna um, run the ROM and uh, show you the debugging tool that I've been using for this whole time because it's a really, <laughs> a really good one. There are a whole bunch of tools that um, have existed in these Game Boy communities for a really long time. And it's kind of amazing that this homebrew scene has been around for as long as it has. Um, if you start getting into Game Boy development and you go onto some of these websites, you'll find websites that look like they were made in the, the mid 90s, still online, some of them, uh, with links to a whole bunch of dead links to websites that don't exist anymore. But if you go onto the internet archive and you see backed up versions, you'll still be able to find some of the old software. You'll be able to find a bunch of old information. And it's just so cool to think that people were doing this kind of stuff, you know, in 1998 and 1999, um, like without all of the access and knowledge that we have now, uh, the, the huge swaths of data that talk about how to do Game Boy programming and every secret of, of 
of the hardware. You know, back then these these people didn't know exactly how the hardware worked and they were just trying different things. So this project very much stands on the shoulders of all the giants that came before in the last sort of 30 years or so. And uh, yeah, so I'm really thankful for that. So I just want to kind of uh, run the ROM in one of these emulators, which is quite old at this point, but has a fantastic debugger. Um, and that will give you a sense of, uh, of, of how I've been working through some of the many, many problems that have come up while writing this game. All right, so let's compile block jump. And of course, like what we'll see is a whole bunch of labels that come out of this. So all the different functions and uh, various things and, you know, all the different labels that get generated by some of the macros and also all of the RAM uh, variables. And you'll see that in the end, the game is only 2,409 bytes out of a maximum of 32,768. And I only used 184 bytes of RAM out of a possible 8K. So, you know, this is pretty good. I had something like 5K usage of the, of the RAM before I did the uh, the run length encoding. The run length encoding worked very, very well on this data because I had tons and tons of repeated tiles. So it's just the perfect, uh, the perfect kind of data for compression in that way. But it basically bought me back another 3k of space. So if I was kind of at the very end of the game and I really needed to to get some more some more space, that run length encoding would really save me. And of course, you do need to take into account uh, that whenever you have a decompression routine or a compression routine, you sort of need to account for like the the code that does that too. Like this is an intrinsic part of the the cost of your compression, right? How expensive is it? to include the decompressor. Um, that's something that people often don't talk about when they compress files. It's like, yeah, I compressed this file. Look how, look how small it is. But they don't talk about how big the decompressor is and how much space that takes up. And in the Game Boy, this is just very, very apparent because you, know, you can compress data as well as you like, but if all you've done is the same amount of work in assembly instructions, then you haven't really saved yourself as much as you might think you have. So good to take that sort of stuff into account. All right, now we have the built ROM. I'm gonna run uh, this emulator, which is called BGB. So <coughs> here on Linux, you have to run that with Wine, um, but it runs perfectly in Wine. I haven't had any problems. So this is in emulation, BGB, bgb.exe. And the game is in, I believe it just gets spit out to the directory here called test.gb. I should change that so that it's called block jump. All right, so I'm going to run this now. Okay, so I'm here in BGB now, and you can see that I've got this kind of debugging window open onto the side here, and I've got my main game uh, showing at this point. And I'm actually stopped at a breakpoint, which is the title screen routine in the main game state machine. So basically, um, we're on the title screen and we are gonna run this code, which uh, figures some stuff out. So the immediate stuff that's happening here is it's loading uh, the number hexadecimal 10 into the A register. And you can see over here that the A register currently has zero inside. It groups the uh, registers together in pairs here. So we see AF, uh, A is here on the left, uh, F is over on the right. And you can also see the relevant flags that are currently set. So we can see that the zero flag is currently set. The negative, uh, sorry, the N flag is currently set. And the N flag, I believe this is the negative flag. Like uh, this resulted in a two's complement, two's complement negative uh, number. We have the H flag, which is the half carry flag, uh, which is, um, well, let's not get into that, but it's to do with uh, the difference between 4-bit adders and 8-bit adders. And then finally, we have the carry flag. And the only ones we really care about in this case are going to be the zero flag and the carry flag. Uh, if you're an emulator developer, you might actually care about looking at these a lot more because you want to make sure that your instructions do set these ones correctly. But for, for all intents and purposes, the only sort of programmatic things we care about are the, the Z register and the, the, the C register. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to load up 10 uh, into the A register. 
And that is actually to, uh, a constant to do with the buttons that we're asking for from the joypad register. So this register here, FF00, that is the joypad register. BGB actually knows about this without me needing to tell it through the symbol file. So what I can do is I can press F3 to step through. So I've loaded up uh, hexadecimal 10 into A and I'm gonna uh, load that into the uh, input register and then I'm gonna immediately read back from the input register and that is gonna provide back DF. Now remember that um, buttons being active are uh, are set as, as um, zero. So if a button is active, set as zero. So right now you can see that there aren't really any buttons active. And one of the nice things we can do is, you can't see this, but um, I'm clicking the context menu here and I'm opening up one of the uh, side menus called joypads. And if I open up joypads, um, unfortunately I can't show you in my current OBS setup, but there I actually have the ability to kind of set buttons on and off while I'm in the debugger. And this is such a great feature. I mean, I can't explain how useful this is because it actually allows you to um, change the value of a button press while you're debugging frame to frame. Now, if you've ever done any web development and you've tried to, uh, <laughs> you've tried to debug things like mouse down, mouse move, mouse up events, then you'll know why this is so nice. Uh, because this really allows you to, to sort of like set those in the moment and turn them off when you care about it. And oh, it's great. I love BGB. I don't have enough good words to say about it. Okay. So what we're doing here is we're just stepping through. We're going to end with, uh, uh, with eight and we see that eight is left and that's not good because uh, this should be zero if we are um, if it's actually the, the thing we care about um, we do a sort of unnecessary compare here and that's because I'm using macros that that look at the compare but I'm willing to eat that one assembly instruction and then basically what we're doing is kind of you know returning from there and going through the main state machine again so in order to uh, just go back to execution, you just click on the game again, and I'm gonna remove my breakpoint because it's gonna stop there automatically. And if I now press start, uh, we're gonna go into the main game. And you see it looks quite a bit uh, <laughs> sort of more graphically uh, <laughs> sort of animated than it does on the Game Boy. Of course, the colors are much more vibrant here. It does share the, the Game Boy's color palette, which is kind of a traditional gray, uh, a traditional green. So my Game Boy Pocket even has the improved color palette, but uh, it still looks pretty pretty awful. This improved quite a lot on the Game Boy Color, uh, of course, uh, because that enabled much more graphical capabilities, but emulators will always do much more justice to the, the look of a game, and especially one without a backlight. So here I died, um, but let's just take a look at, say, a physics routine, which is something I spent quite a lot of my time uh, debugging. So let's uh, scroll down to jump physics and we will put a breakpoint in jump physics falling. So um, yeah, this is one thing that does happen in BGB. It will sort of randomly snap the scroll to places that you weren't expecting it to. But again, I'm not gonna complain about that. Um, so where are we? Looking for the physics game. Uh, so we have jump physics and jump physics falling. So I'm going to put a breakpoint there. If I press start, well, it's interesting because I actually start falling. <coughs> and that is because um, uh, when, when you uh, get game over and you uh, go back to the game over screen, even though I update the obstacles to end up back in sort of like their default state, I don't put the character's Y position back to the ground. Um, and that's because I thought it just kind of looks cooler that you come in in a jumping state. And I guess I also kind of forgot. But that's fine because basically what we can do is just step through until... Um, step through. Well, one of the things you can do is just press F9, which just sort of runs. So we would run frame to frame. Okay, so now I am uh, should jump, and I got to the maximum time that I could jump for, and now I'm going to begin falling. So uh, that's going to be what happens there. So you can see that this is really, really nice to, um, to work with, and you can see all of these symbol names that are in the uh, 
all of these symbol names, they make debugging so much easier. And just as a, like a, the last point, uh, when I was writing this the first time around, I hadn't read the full symbol file specification. I didn't even realize that there was a full symbol file specification, but I was kind of making some assumptions about how I could encode these symbols. And I was then not seeing um, my symbols appear. And the way that the symbols are actually loaded is in this automatic way in that if you load up a ROM and you happen to have uh, in the same directory with the same file name, but the extension is .sim, then it will automatically try and load that and pass it as a symbol file. And it wasn't recognizing my symbols. And for a good week or so, I was doing my debugging by going back to the code and referencing all of those output um, label names that you see. And that was just truly a nightmare. Uh, it makes it really, really hard to kind of figure out where you are and what's happening. Um, and when I finally figured out that there was a proper specification and I went and read it and I realized what I was doing wrong, finally, uh, these labels just popped to life in the emulator and uh, really made this debugging experience a lot better. So hats off to uh, BGB. There are actually a lot more emulators out there. There's another emulator called Sameboy, um, which is available natively on Linux. It also has a debugger, but it's more of a GDB style command debugger, which is great. I actually uh, don't mind that at all, but I do find that having a visual debugger like this um, can really uh, make your life easier. You know, that you don't have to ask for the information, the information is just there. And that's a really useful trait to have. So on that note, I think um, I'm kind of going to kind of wrap this up here. And I just wanna say a big thank you for those of you who've watched to the end here. I really appreciate it. And I'm glad to share these kind of projects with um, other people who are interested in this stuff. So thank you. Um, I've really enjoyed this project. This has been a huge learning experience, uh, really challenging, but also really rewarding. And I'd recommend anyone out there to um, just dive into this kind of stuff. I mean, uh, emulators are available, tool chains are available. You don't really even need the hardware. You can just get started in this kind of stuff. So I would say give it a go. And if you wanna give Tega a go as well, uh, you know, let me know if you find bugs and let me know if you need help. And I'm, I'm definitely happy to help out in that respect. So uh, again, thank you very much. And I'll see you in the next one.